Hi everyone, my name is Valerie Palmer. I'm the School Counseling Department Chair here at Green Run. Um, traditionally, during open house or just before open house, we would offer a senior parent college info session. Um, but since we're not able to hold that in person, we did want to still offer you some um, online option or, or webinar option so that you can still get the same information. Uh, we've decided this year to include also some basic career information for students transitioning straight to um, a job after high school, as well as some military information for those students. Um, so as I begin this uh, senior parent info session, I'm just going to ask you for some grace because I'm not the most technologically savvy person and I may make a few blunders while, while going through this and get a little tongue tied and twisted or talk too fast. Um, because it's something that I'm really passionate about, college and career um, information with our students. So um, please bear with me and I'm going to do my best to be mindful of your time as well. So I'm going to try not to go over 35 minutes or so. So let's go. All right. The first thing that I wanted to just go over with everyone so that we're all on the same page as we begin this is, is who the counselors are and what their roles are in terms of, um, you know, academic and career planning for the future for when students are, are out or getting ready to graduate. Um, so I do have a list of the counselors and their caseload. I'm sure at this point you all know that we break up our caseloads by last name. So it goes, it does go by student last name. On the far side of your screen, you should see the information about what counselors do, what their roles are in this process. And so we do, we take on a lot. Um, we do senior presentations, um, not only for parents, but for students as well. And then we do senior status meetings. Those are individual meetings that we have with each student where we go over their graduation requirements for their specific diploma, as well as where they are in terms of meeting those graduation requirements. We hope that we will be able to begin conducting the, those senior presentations and senior status meetings the week of October 5th. Um, barring any crazy te technical difficulties, that should be the case. We do transcript review for every student, um, but in particular our seniors, to make sure that they are on track, they're in all of the classes they need in order to graduate. So we've already done that for all of our seniors. So for all of your students, that's already completed. We write letters of recommendation. I'll talk a little bit more about this um, in some of the coming slides, um, but so just sort of a, a side note there. We do personal student meetings, and so this is essentially, these are essentially meetings that are ongoing above and beyond the senior status meetings. So if students have questions, if they need some additional assistance, um, we would continue to meet with them individually to help them along the way. Um, keep in mind right now that that is going to be in a virtual setting. Normally, we would do that face-to-face, -face, but for the moment, it's going to be virtual. We do coordinate ASVAB testing. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that more later. Um, we do academic and career plans with all of our students. We do career exploration as needed, um, and we do resume um, and interview skills seminars as needed for our students. All right, so here's where I'm gonna ask for a little bit more grace. Um, my initial thought with this presentation was that we would get to this slide and you all would be able to just choose which path your child was on. You could you know, click on the career path or the college path or the military path and it would take you straight to that portion of the, the presentation. Unfortunately, I'm not tech savvy, savvy enough to make that happen. So I am gonna run through all of the slides from beginning to end. So I say that so you know, feel free to skip ahead if you need to. Um, if your student is looking for information on the military or, or you're looking for information on the military for your student, that's gonna be towards the end. So feel free to skip ahead. Um, if you just want information about the college path, then go ahead and just watch that information. Either way, I just ask that you do go to the last slide um, because we have a survey there or a link for a survey there. It's only three questions. Um, and it's basically just to find out if you have any questions so that we can get those answers to you. All right, so we're gonna start off with the college path. So the college path, I'm gonna go over the basics, how students request transcripts, and then some of the basics of financial aid. Um, I'm gonna put in a plug here for our access advisor, Mr. Cameron Williams. He does hold a financial aid night every year, usually September, October timeframe. Um, as far as I know, he's still planning to do that. So please be on the lookout for information about that. 
I'm going to go over the basics of financial aid, but he will delve into a lot more detail. Um, and that would help answer a lot of any lingering questions that you may have. Okay, so let's talk about timeline for colleges. Um, this is really important. So most colleges applications open um, on September 1st or right around September 1st. This includes the Common App. Um, so that doesn't mean that students have to apply starting in September 1st. There are a lot of colleges, in fact, most colleges across the country are rolling admissions. And so they will accept applications through February, March, um, sometimes even April. And so, you know, it's this isn't to say that they have to start today or tomorrow working on their college application, but it is just to let you know that that is available. And so if they have maybe a study block for semester and, and you want them to start working on that, it's a great time to do it. Um, the next timeline that I have listed here is the FAFSA. That does open October 1st. This date is much more pressing. Um, it is very early in my personal opinion, but the people of the FAFSA have decided that that's what's best for families and colleges. And so by all means, that's what they're going to do. Um, you will see in the very next line that the FAFSA has a preferred deadline, typically in December or January, or I should say colleges have preferred deadlines for the FAFSA. So what that means is as long as you're getting your FAFSA in in December, potentially January the latest, you're going to qualify for the most amount of money possible. So that's why this October 1st deadline becomes really important. Um, you don't have to fill it out on October 1st. However, I would recommend, you know, the latest that over that Thanksgiving break, you have it filled out um, and submitted to the colleges that, that your child is planning to apply to if they haven't already completed those applications. Um, and then unfortunately, my head is blocking the date for National Decision Day. My apologies on that. Um, National Decision Day for all colleges is May 1st every year. So that's the date that you have to let colleges know whether or not you're going to attend. Um, if you've applied regular decision, rolling admissions, um, they have to give you legally until May 1st to make that decision. Um, once May 1st hits, if you do not have a deposit in, they are not legally required to hold a spot for, for your student. So that's why that date becomes so important. Okay, so let's talk about who does what because we've already covered some, some really important information and you might be wondering, well, how does all of this happen? So I mentioned counselors, we do senior presentations and senior status meetings, um, transcript reviews, letters of recommendations and personal student meetings. Um, so we handle all of that. So we're basically here to be your and your students guide through this process. Um, the letters of recommendation, I wanted to just touch on that for a brief second. So each counselor, counselor, excuse me, has their own sort of format and system for a letter of recommendation. Um, and they may require different things. So for my students, for example, I have a questionnaire that I have them fill out um, that gives me some more information that I may not have otherwise had that's above and beyond what's on their resume or on their transcript. Um, because just like a college, I can look at their resume and transcript and see those things. So I'm not trying to regurgitate that information. Other counselors may feel differently. So they may ask for the student to provide them with a resume. Um, teachers are likely going to ask for a resume and a transcript and maybe some other information. So just make sure that your student is communicating um, with those people who are going to write those letters of recommendation early um, and finding out what they need. Another example, I require my students to give me at least two weeks notice for when they need a letter of recommendation sent to a college. The reason that I ask that is I unfortunately have a lot of other things going on um, at work. And so I can't just take the time to sit down and, and write for a full day for a couple of students. Um, and my process is a bit lengthy. I like to go back and edit and make sure everything um, is, is not only 100% accurate, but is well phrased and well worded. Um, so for me, it just takes a little bit longer. Um, other people might be able to do it quicker. So just make sure that your student is communicating um, with those letter writers. Okay, so for parents and students, um, your responsibility is to research colleges, come up with a list. Certainly counselors can help with that. Um, 
just like they can help with anything on your side of the list, um, but we can't do it for you. So make sure that they are researching their colleges um, and research college visits. So obviously college visits these days look a lot different than they have in the past. Fortunately, most colleges, um, they have where they had um, set up virtual visits and virtual tours prior to COVID. So they were really well prepared to continue on that trend um, now that COVID is here. And so they've just sort of upped the ante and, and provided more um, in different types of virtual visits. So make sure that your, your child or your student is looking at those virtual visits and taking advantage of those. Um, being aware of deadlines. Um, so if they are applying to an early action or early decision, um, process, they need to be aware of those specific deadlines. Um, if there are any other deadlines that the school has, some schools have different deadlines for different things. Um, and certainly we can talk more about that if you have specific questions, but um, just make sure that you're aware of those. Unfortunately, colleges are outside of our control, so we aren't able to get extensions for students. Um, they take their deadlines very seriously. The next bullet point that I have here is to take the SATs or ACTs. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, but the reason that I put the take SATs or ACTs under the parent student responsibility um, is because we as counselors are not able to sign them up for the SATs or ACTs. Um, a lot of students and parents get confused because they do take the PSAT automatically at school and think that we are able to sign them up. Unfortunately, we aren't. We don't have access to that. So, Students need to go to either collegeboard.org or act.org, um, respectively, to sign up for either of those tests that they want to take. Um, most of our students do already have a College Board login, and so a lot of them get confused because they get the message that they need to log into their account when they try and create an account. They most again, most of our students created those accounts back in 10th grade, and so they probably don't remember the login. If that's the case, that's fine. Just have them, you know, submit the or click on the forgot my password link, um, and that will allow them to reset their password again. Because College Board is its own entity and it's its own organization, we aren't able to do that or see that for them. Um, so I talked about letters of recommendation. Like I said, it is the student's responsibility to ask for those letters. Um, and again, I put this onus on the student, not the parent at all, um, because I'm not writing a letter for parents. I'm writing a letter for students. So the student needs to be the one to communicate that with me. Um, and then next, you know, just making sure that your application is um, the best that it can be. And I'll talk more about ways to boost your application shortly. All right, so like I said, I was going to come back to testing, and here we are. Lots of schools since COVID are going test optional. There have been, you know, a number of testing sites that have shut down, a number of testing dates that have just been canceled altogether. And so schools, colleges recognize that that's, that could be a barrier. So um, I've listed just a few here that, you know, some of our students do apply to that have gone test optional. Um, the only exception to this was, is Christopher Newport. They've been test optional for a few years, um, but the other ones here on this very brief list are, are going test optional for the 2020-2021 application cycle. So this year's seniors application cycle. Um, if you want a, li a list of schools, of every school that's going test optional, um, I did provide a link. Hopefully you can access that. I'm not sure if you can. But if you Google it, um, there are plenty of lists already generated out there um, for you to see. And of course, any college they're considering, the admissions office will be able to tell them that as well. Um, we will post that link on our website and on our Schoology page so students can access this link as well so that they can just have a quick reference um, if they would like it. All right, so the next thing I said, and I know I'm kind of blocking that again, is um, to be sure that essays are flawless. We've heard from some college admissions reps that they are looking at essays very heavily or a lot more heavily than they have in the past. Um, and so this is, 
This is really important. If they don't have test scores to look at, they are going to be looking at other factors to decide and determine if a student is going to be able to be successful academically at their institution. And so in, the essay is one way that they do that. So just make sure that, you know, these are proofread multiple times over. Um, I know a number of our English teachers are very willing to read essays to help students, you know, as needed. Um, but definitely make sure that those essays are, are as flawless as possible. And then the last bullet point says, ask for letters of recommendation from trusted sources. Um, this may seem obvious, but every so often I have a student come into my office and say, yeah, I asked this one teacher, but I don't think that I did really well in their class and I didn't turn in a lot of work for them. So I don't know. And, and if the, if your gut feeling is, I don't know if that person can write a good essay for me, probably don't ask them if that's your gut feeling. Um, but definitely just make sure that you're thinking through who you're asking for letters of recommendation from, because, um, it, it's going to be important. So one more piece on letters of recommendation, um, that I didn't mention in the last slide, but I just want to touch on really quickly is that students do need to make sure that they ask. And, that, and I know that seems like a given, but sometimes they don't realize that because a lot of letters of recommendation are now optional, we don't know if they need them. So just make sure that they are actually asking the people that they would like to write those letters. Okay, so how do you boost your application? Um, it's senior year, what can you do at this point? Obviously, there's a big push just to focus on your academics. Um, a lot of seniors are tempted to just take as few classes as possible or to take the easiest classes possible. Um, and that's never really the best <laughs> recommendation from, from the school counseling side. If a student wants to present as a strong candidate, even if they maybe have struggled slightly academically in the past, they would want to continue to push themselves. Um, this is going to show the admissions committees that they're still they're they haven't given up. They they don't have a case of senioritis. They're still willing to work hard. Um, so definitely make sure that they're focusing on those academics. Um, if you happen to have a student who is a freshman, sophomore, or junior, and you're watching this, encourage them to focus on their academics. Um, it is a giant misnomer that only junior and senior year count or freshman year doesn't count. Um, that's not <laughs> unfortunately accurate at all. So make sure that from day one, they're focusing on academics if at all possible. Um, obviously test scores and or essays are a big way to boost your application. Um, and then after that, you know, clubs or sorry, colleges want to see that you're involved, that you're not just going home. I say, and sitting there, however, right now we kind of are, um, but that you haven't done that in the past. So if you've done any volunteering, make sure that you highlight that in your application or on your resume. Um, any clubs or organizations that you've been a part of, make sure that that's listed somewhere on your application, especially if you've had any leadership positions, because that is something that they love to see. Um, if you've done any part-time work, if you had a job over the summer, um, or you have a job now, make sure that that is highlighted on your application, as well as any sports that you've participated in. Um, they want students who are going to contribute to their student body, who are going to be active um, and, and doing things on campus. And so they really want to see what you bring to the table. Um, so make sure that they can see that in your application. Okay, so requesting transcripts. Um, we give all of our students a parchment code when we meet with them. Um, so they will come home, or I guess not come home, but they will, after our meeting, have their own personal parchment code. And that allows them to go onto parchment and it has a, we've already partially created a profile for them. If they already have an, a parchment account, they don't need to use the code. It's automatically gonna link to Green Run. So basically what happens is they go to parchment.com slash code, and all of this is on the, the directions that we give them. They put in their access code. It says, are you so-and-so? Are you Miss Valerie Palmer from Green Run High School? And I say, yes, I am. And then it asks me a few other questions um, just to verify I am who I am and to get their information accurate in their system. 
Once I verify all of that, it takes maybe two to three minutes. It's very quick, very simple, very easy. Um, then I'm able as a student to go in and request transcripts. So it's really quite sim a simple process. Um, if you feel that you need some more detailed instructions, they have released a manual for, for parents and students. It's quite lengthy, um, but I did provide the link to that there. And so essentially what happens is once students have a transcript, they log into their account, they request their transcript, and then they can track their transcript. So they can see, has my school sent it yet? Did my college or university receive it yet? Um, so they're able to track that whole process right from their parchment account. So there's no wondering, did this get lost in the mail or did, did my counselor forget to send it? Um, and we go, we do go in and check those in the fall, especially every day. Um, but in, you know, in this, in the later months, like late spring and summer, we're usually only checking them a couple times a week. Um, but we are usually pretty quick about processing those. So, so please don't feel like you need to let us know because we do get email alerts from parchment as well. Um, and once we send it, it takes less than 24 hours for them to receive it typically. Okay, so let's talk about financial aid, just a little bit of the basics. I'm going to talk about FAFSA and I'm going to talk about scholarships because they are two separate things. So the FAFSA, the FAFSA stands for the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. And so this gives students access to money on both the federal level and the state level. Even though it's one federal application, it, it does both federal and state monies. So what's covered in that? The Pell Grant is covered in that. Work study is covered in that. Federal loans are covered in that. And then certain colleges have college specific grants. Um, typically these are gonna be your private schools um, or schools with large endowments and that will give you access to those college specific grants. Um, so these, like I said, this is very different than looking at, at scholarship pieces. Um, and so other general information about the FAFSA, like I said before, it opens October 1st. The earlier you fill it out, the better. Um, basically, the way that Mr. Williams likes to describe it, and I, and I have stolen from him, I'll admit it, um, because I really appreciate the way that this makes sense to my brain, is that there, there are two pots of money. Um, there's a state pot and a federal pot. And typically the state pot of money runs out first. Um, so the longer you wait past, you know, the the end of November, the less likely there is to be some of that state money left. So you've just, if you really wait past December or January, you've really just limited yourself to one pot of money. And that's that federal money. So federal loans um, and the Pell Grant, which is actually tied to the state. So really it's federal loans and work study. Um, so the earlier you fill that out, the better. It is free to fill out. Um, and I did put the, the website below, which I believe is, it used to be fafsa.gov. Um, I think it's changed to maybe studentaid.gov, um, but I did put that website down there. I tell everybody that it's free and, and that might sound maybe crazy. You know, why are you telling us this? It's, it's the free application. Of course it's free. Um, but I say that because I can't tell you how many parents I've spoken to that have said to me, yeah, I filled out the FAFSA. It was a hundred dollars. No, it's free. Don't pay to fill it out. Um, there are websites out there that look almost identical, but will charge you up to a hundred dollars to fill it out. Please don't do that. <laughs> um, please go to the actual government sanctioned site so that it is free for you. Another thing I tell people is to apply even if you think you won't qualify. Um, a lot of people have said that to me, well, I make too much money or I'm not gonna qualify for anything. And, and that may be true, but more often than not, I found that it's not true, that parents and, and families thought that that would be the case, um, but they still qualified for something. So I always recommend filling it out even if you think you won't qualify. And then unfortunately with the FAFSA, it's basically a hurry up and wait game. So you're going to hurry up and you're going to fill it out. And then you're going to wait around for what feels like forever. So um, giving you this warning now, most federal or excuse me, most um, financial aid packages are not sent out until usually around March, sometimes as late as April. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, they have to verify that that information is correct. Um, and then they need to make sure that your student has applied. 
you won't get an application or excuse me, you won't get um, a financial aid package if your student has not completed the application process for the school and been accepted. So just make sure that you all are aware of that. And that's another reason that deadlines are so important. Um, so once your student applies and is accepted and they've already filled out the FAFSA, then the, the financial aid offices need to verify the information and then get packages around. So again, typically that happens in March. Um, it is frustrating. And I have parents and students every year who come into my office and say, Ms. Palmer, but I haven't heard anything yet. I know. I'm sorry. Unfortunately, it's another one of those things that's out of my hands. Um, it just takes a long time. Okay, um, I also have a lot of parents come to me and say, well, I'm gonna pay somebody to do the FAFSA for me. And I certainly say, you know, if that's what you would like to do, by all means, feel free. Um, however, the FAFSA is actually now very easy to fill out. It used to be unbelievably cumbersome. It was like quantum physics, I swear, back when I was applying to college and had to fill this thing out. Um, now it's all submitted online. And you don't even necessarily have to input your tax information. Um, you can do, you can transfer your tax information straight from the IRS website to the FAFSA, which means that you don't have to transpose numbers um, and try and figure out what form you filled out and what line you need to go to. Um, it literally will do it for you in, in about 95% of the cases. So I recommend using that. Um, it's, it's called the IRS data retrieval tool. And when you get to the, you know, you'll fill out some information and then you'll get to another page and it says, would you like to use the IRS data retrieval tool? Please click yes, because it really saves you a ton of time and a ton of energy and, and a ton of headache. Um, it takes about two minutes for it to process. Um, it's very quick. And then everything is filled out. You just review it and basically submit after that. So it, it makes the process much easier. Okay, so here are some scholarship resources. Um, we do have division sanctioned scholarships that we send out as a school and as a division. Typically we get these out through Alert Now, so we get these out through Twitter. We put these on Schoology for students. Um, so they're able to apply for any scholarship that they, they qualify for, um, for those division sanction, sanctioned scholarships. Um, certain colleges do have college specific scholarships, not all colleges do, but certain, um, certain colleges do. So if they have scholarships, make sure you find out if you have to apply or if you're automatically considered, um, if you're automatically considered once you're accepted, then you don't have to do anything. However, if you have to apply for them, then, then you would just need to submit the documentation to that college. And then finally, there are, um, scholarship search engines out there. And there are a number of them. You can find them literally by just Googling scholarship search engine. The only thing that I recommend is, is to not pay for a scholarship search engine. They should be free. There are tons and tons of free ones out there that are very good, reliable, trustworthy sites. Um, so please don't pay for that, but there, there are plenty of those as well. All right, um, I do have one college resource here. Um, again, I'm not sure if the link is going to work, but this is something that we're going to provide to our seniors if they would like a copy of it. Um, and it's a senior year planning guide for students. And it basically is a place for them to write down a lot of that pertinent information, as well as some questionnaires to help them narrow down um, colleges that they may be interested in. So wanted to give you that heads up that they have access to that or they will have access to that. All right, I believe that this wraps up my college portion. Um, I'm gonna go on to um, the career portion next. Um, if you no longer um, need to watch the rest of this, please just skip ahead to the end so that you can get to that survey. Like I said, and fill that survey out. Um, and just let us know if you have any other questions, if there's anything that we can do um, to help assist you. Okay, so the career path. Um, for this section, I'm going to talk about resumes, I'm going to talk about interviewing, and I'm going to talk about, talk about our local job market. So there's a bunch of different types of resumes, um, and, and it can be really confusing and misleading and leave students really unsure of what to do and how to create a resume. 
Um, and so I want to just talk briefly about the different types, the different formats, and then what they should include on their resume. So you have the traditional resumes, which are what we consider chronological resumes. They go in order um, of work experience from most recent to um, least recent, basically. There are functional, which, which basically serve to highlight skills of the employee. And then there's combination, which is a combination of both. Um, you see my next bullet point says infographic with a question mark. And you might be wondering, does she mean to do that? Um, the answer is yes. And so I've done a lot of research since COVID has happened to, to find out, you know, what are the hiring trends, not only locally, but nationally, what's working to get people hired. Um, and some of what I've seen suggests that, you know, traditional resumes, chronological, functional combination are sort of on the way out. Um, especially for high school students, um, and that that students and and even adults are much more able to advocate for themselves and and um, show what their skills are by using infographics. Um, I'm not tech savvy, so this is not something that I would be good at. But I know a lot of our students are, and so that's certainly something that they can, you know, if they wanted to do that, they could do that. Um, and especially with all of the, the recent hiring trends being more virtual, um, people are finding that they really need to do something to stand out in the marketplace and infographic resumes um, or just infographics highlighting their skills are a great way to do that. So what goes on a resume, whether that's a traditional resume or an infographic style resume, um, you wanna include education. Um, so they, they need to have their high school on there. Um, I have include GPA in parentheses because it's important. However, if they have below a 2.5 GPA, it's probably not something that I would necessarily include. They certainly can. It's sort of a gray area there. If they've got above a 2.5, I would definitely recommend including their GPA. If they've had any work experience, um, whether that's paid or unpaid work experience, um, so jobs or volunteering, they should list that on their resume. They should list any clubs and activities they did and especially highlight any leadership skills, um, any major achievements, awards, or honors um, that they have um, received throughout their high school career should be included. Any major projects that they worked on, whether that be school projects or personal, excuse me, personal projects, that should be included. And then lastly, additional skills. And I put additional skills at the bottom, but really it's one of the, the biggest focuses of current resumes is what your skills are. So probably that should be at the top because it's one of the most important things. Um, and keep in mind that all of this is, is relevant and recent to high school. So I've had seniors come in and they have things on their resume from fifth grade and sixth grade. That's great. And, and please don't mistake. I think that's wonderful that they've been involved that long, um, whether that's in extracurriculars or doing something um, for a project or leadership. Um, however, when it comes to resumes, we really think of things in terms of being recent and relevant. Um, so recent for them is going to be the span of their high school career. Um, so unfortunately, most of those things, anything from middle school is probably going to need to come off um, just as a heads up. I know, and that's kind of heartbreaking for me to do too. All right, so there's a lot of do's and don'ts with resumes. They, all students and, and really everybody wants to make sure that the resume is personal to you. Um, there are lots of templates online that you can use to make your resume. There's there's templates in Word. There's templates in Google. Please don't use the templates. Um, number one, it takes out that personal element um, of your own personal style. And number two, it makes it extremely hard for you to edit in the future. Um, and really, the third, the third part of that is a lot of times those templates don't email well or don't um, upload well. So if you're applying for a job online and it, and it requires that you email or upload your resume, it may look different when you send it than it does on your own computer. So don't use a template. Please use, you know, just a blank Word document or just a blank Google document um, to create that and make it your own. 
highlight your skills. Like I said in, in the last slide, skills are probably the biggest and most important part of your resume these days. Employers want to know what you can do. Um, and even if you don't feel like you have a ton of skills because you're still in high school, that's not true. You have lots of skills. It just might take a little bit of brainstorming for you to really figure out what those are. Um, and then fill in as much of the page as possible. So um, I have students every year who bring me a resume and it's, um, it'll be, you know, one and a half pages. And that's great that you've got enough stuff to put on there for one and a half pages. But as a high schooler, your, your resume should probably really only be one page. Um, definitely not more than two. Um, no one should be more than two, to be honest, unless you're doing a federal resume, which is 100% different and not even something that we're gonna like look into here. Um, but don't leave a lot of white space. Um, make sure that you have, you know, you're, you're filling in sentences, you're, you're using both sides of the page. Um, and I have some great examples at the bottom down here. Um, and you can see some of them do have a career objective on that. Please don't use a career objective or an objective of any kind. Use, um, use a skills section or a personal profile section. Um, some of the, some of these do have really good skills and personal profile sections on them. So definitely look at that. Um, but these are great examples of how you can fill up your page, um, and, and convey a lot of information on one page of stuff of, of writing. Interviewing. So in this first part of interviewing, I'm going to talk mostly about interviewing online. As I mentioned, since we've gone to this COVID world, we are, or employers are doing a lot more virtual hiring. So it's really common to have interviews through Skype, through Zoom, through, I mean, any one of a number of online platforms. Um, so really it's important to embrace the art of video interviewing. How do you do this? Well, the first way is to test your technology before your interview time. Um, nothing is worse than if you you know, it's, it's, you know, 3.30 and your interview starts at 3.30 and you start up your computer and, and you can't get the link to work. Um, that, that definitely doesn't set the right tone for your interview. So just make sure that your technology works beforehand. Um, be personable. I know that's hard sometimes, especially when you feel like you can't really interact with somebody face to face. Um, but be as personal as possible, personable as possible. Dress professionally, even though you are on camera, they can still see you. Um, so make sure that you're looking as professional as possible. That brings me to my next point, turn on your camera. Um, I recently read an article about interviewing online and it said that we all have to get over our fears of turning on our camera. And I know that's not always easy, but I've tried to embrace that and video myself today. Um, hopefully I haven't made a total fool of myself, but that's all right. Um, and then be in a place with minimal distractions, both sound distractions and background distractions. Um, so as you can see, like right behind me, there's, there's nothing. Um, and, and I know that's not always possible, but do your best to minimize any distractions in the background. Um, and then in terms of sound distractions, sometimes we can't help that. So if you've got a dog or your neighbor has a dog and they bark a lot, just let them know at the beginning of the interview, you know. I have a dog. I'm really sorry there, you know, he or she is probably going to bark a lot throughout this interview. I'm going to do my best to um, minimize that distraction. Um, and they'll appreciate that you're upfront about that. All right. So if you're interviewing in person, in person, um, most of these same principles still apply. Be personable, dress professionally, um, and be a few minutes early. And really the interview is your time to sell yourself. Um, the resume gets you in the door, the resume and application get you in the door, but the interview is going to, is, is going to be what sells you on that position. Um, and ultimately interviewing is a time for you to not only answer questions and, and for the company to find out if you're a good fit for them, but also for you to find out if they're a good fit for you. Um, I strongly believe that like, yes, if you need to work by all means, like, please do, but you know, there are going to be instances where you find that you interview and, and the company just isn't the best fit for you. And so in the interview is the best place to find that out rather than after you've been hired and you're working there for a couple of weeks. So take that opportunity to ask your questions as well.
All right, so the local market. Um, I wanted to touch on this just really quickly because there have been a lot of a lot of changes and a lot of fluctuations um, with COVID. Um, and so I did some research just to make sure that all of this is accurate and I could give you the most up-to-date information. Um, obviously, we have several apprenticeship programs in the area. The biggest one is the Shipyard Apprenticeship Program. Um, the Shipyard is, is the biggest employer in the area. The way most people get hired, especially right out of high school, is through the apprenticeship program. Does that mean that you have to go through the apprenticeship program? Absolutely not. Um, but it is typically the, the, the easiest way to get hired. So if that's what you're considering doing, um, definitely consider their apprenticeship program. Um, another big apprenticeship program in the area is through HRSD. Um, it's, it's definitely way less known. It's not nearly as popular, um, but they have something like 10 different career paths that you can do through their apprenticeship program. Um, so definitely another really good one to look into. Hospitality in our area is typically really big. Um, we have a tour season that, that stretches um, a pretty good chunk of the year. And so hospitality has always been a, a strong um, market here in Virginia Beach in the local area. Nationally, we're seeing that these numbers are dwindling because travel is down, people going out to dinner is down, um, people um, going to entertainment events are down. Um, we're seeing some of that effects here in Virginia Beach as well. Um, not as much as in some other areas, but we are still seeing that. So I, I wanted to make sure that I just touched on that because a lot of people, um, you know, they're, I hear a lot of parents say, well, my, my child's just going to go get a job in, in a hotel or in a restaurant. And, and trust me, those are great options, but it might be more challenging now than it has been in the past. Um, however, the converse is the converse to that is the next two bullet points have been increasing. Actually, the next three bullet points have been increasing even in the local market here. Um, so delivery, warehousing, and distribution is on the rise across the nation because we're all staying home more due to COVID-19 and we're ordering more online. And so they need more people who are delivery drivers. They need more people who are working in warehouses and distribution, um, FedEx, UPS, Amazon, all of those. And then, as you know, uh, for a long time, the essential services were the only things that were open. So big box stores, pharmacies, and things like that. Um, so those, those corporations and companies are still hiring pretty frequently and pretty regularly. Um, and then healthcare is also on the rise, not only because we have an aging demographic in the U.S., but also because we're in a healthcare crisis um, with COVID-19. So that is another thing that's on the rise, including in our area. And then education has always been a big um, employer in the Hampton Roads area. So um, that's also on this slide. So these are all great, um, great careers to get into, things that are pre prevalent and usually you can find a decent number of jobs. Now, I'm not putting any information on where to, to do your job searches at. There are a lot of different places. Um, we get job postings. We have a job fair at the end of every year in March. Um, we are hoping a career fair and we're hoping to still have that this year. Um, there are plenty and plenty and plenty of websites that allow you to search for jobs, even as a high school student, um, you know, monster.com, indeed.com, all of those um, allow you to search for jobs in the local area in specific industries. Um, one thing that I would caution against is if you are using a search engine, which definitely makes it a lot easier to find the jobs. Um, really, that's that's honestly the way that we're doing job searches these days is through um, is through those search engines. Um, I don't recommend that you upload your resume to that search engine itself. You're going to be bombarded with emails uh, from companies that may or may not suit you for jobs that may or may not suit you. I tried it once a very long time ago just to see what would happen because somebody said to me that they were getting inundated with emails and I thought, well, it can't be that bad. And it was terrible. So unless you want your inbox to be flooded every day, um, I don't recommend it. Certainly you can if that's your prerogative, but for me, it's just easier to go on and, and have people search ind individually and independently. All right. So now I'm going to transition to the military path. Um, 
This is a little bit more specific um, because there are, there are policies and procedures that are changing with the military on a regular basis. And so there isn't a ton of information that I can share with you that you may not already know. Um, but primarily, I do just want to go over this to make sure that you know you have it in case your student is interested in, in going the military route. So I'm going to talk about the branches of service and then in general what the requirements are to join the military. Um, so as you know, we have five major branches of the military, um, Army, Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard. There are, in addition to these five, there are also National Guard um, as well as reserve units for several of these. Um, and even locally, we have some reserve units and National Guard units. Each of these has a slightly different cutoff age at which someone could join, meaning that um, in the Air Force, if you're over the age of, I believe it's 36, I think it's, it's either 31 or 36, you're no longer eligible to enlist in the Air Force. Um, and I say that only so that so that you all know, and as parents, um, you can help your, your child make those decisions. Typically it's late 20s or early 30s for most of these, um, so they're not in danger of running into that yet, but just as sort of a future planning tool. So the general requirements to join the military, you must be at least 17 years old. Um, you can't join before you're 17. At 17, you can join um, and you can defer your basic training for up to a year if you're still in high school. Students or well, anyone must be a U.S. citizen or have a permanent resident card. Um, you have to be, and I worded this kind of carefully, um, you have to have or be working on your high school diploma or GED. Um, typically, if you're still in high school and you're working towards your high school diploma or GED, then we would provide them with a letter stating that you're in good standing, um, that the student is in good standing and that they would graduate you know, on such and such a date. Um, either that or you already have to have your high school diploma or GED. And I say that because every year I inevitably have a student come into my office and tell me that they want to drop out of school and join the military. And while I think the military is a great path, I have yet to see them let someone in who did not have some sort of completion from high school. Um, the other caveat to this is that their guidelines are constantly changing. So one year they may accept students who have a GED without any questions asked. A couple years later, they may not accept GEDs. They may only accept high school diplomas. And so that's something that we definitely recommend talking to the recruiter about, um, specifically finding out what the requirements are for that branch of service. And then, you know, making sure that you meet those requirements. Um, that includes as well, the being physically fit part. Each branch of, branch of service has its own standards um, that you would need to meet in order to be able to, to enter that branch of service. And the same thing is true with the ASVAB. So students need to take the ASVAB, um, but each branch of service has a minimum cutoff score for the ASVAB that they're willing to accept. So I mentioned earlier that we do offer the ASVAB through counseling. Um, we don't have any dates set up yet for this year because we don't know when it's going to be safe for everyone to return. And so we will set up dates for the ASVAB. Typically, we offer at least three a year in conjunction with the recruiters, the local recruiters. Um, but we haven't been able to set that up yet because we're just not sure when, every, when it's going to be safe for people to come in. Once we do get those dates, that information will be posted on Schoology and on Twitter. Um, so please make sure that your student is following us on those platforms to get that information. Um, and then lastly, we wanted to include the recruiter's information. However, recruiters change um, often and, and we just found out that our Marine Corps recruiter is actually getting ready to leave. And so we didn't really think that it was fair to have some and not all since we wouldn't have the new contact information. Um, we do keep a book of that in, in the school counseling department that students can look at when we're back in session or that we can give them that information um, if they request it, um, you know, virtually, either through email or a Schoology message, we can certainly give them that information so that they can contact the recruiter that um, of the service that they are in, most interested in and find out the exact specifics from that recruiter directly. 
So what happens next? Um, as I mentioned, we are doing our senior presentations, um, hopefully the week of October 5th. And so we are gonna review college path, career path and military path with them at that time. Later that week or potentially the following week, we're gonna be holding all of our senior status meetings so we're going to meet one-on-one -on -one with those with all of our seniors to talk about what their plans are um, how we can support them and then we will follow up with individual planning um, so if students some students need more assistance and support than others um, but by all means if your student has any questions or concerns please have them contact their counselor all right i truly appreciate all of your time and effort um, to to watch this and bear with me as i you know got long-winded and, and made some blenders here and there. But um, so thank you so much for, for taking the time to watch this. Like I said, we have a brief survey. It really is just three questions. Um, we're just wanting to make sure that we can address any questions that you all still have that that are unanswered from, you know, from after watching this presentation. So please do go to our, our survey. It's tinyurl.com backslash SEN-PAR-INFO-SURVEY. So short for Senior Parent Info Survey. Um, please fill that out and let us know what questions you have so we can, we can address those for you. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day.